All right, everybody. So we're going to get started with injury and illness. My name's Sebastian. This is chapter 14 of your Brain Facts book. If you don't have ac access to the Brain Facts book, you can get it free as a PDF online. Just look up brainfacts.org. Uh, but anyway, let's get right into it. So neurological illnesses. So this is a list of some neurological illnesses that you guys should be familiar with, at least to a, a, a small extent. Um, we have tumors. Tumors can often be called neoplasms as well, so tumors or neoplasms. TBI or trauma, TBI stands for traumatic brain injury, uh, and strokes, and then spinal cord injuries. You might see spinal cord injuries as SCI, just abbreviated SCI. Uh, to talk a little bit about strokes as well, strokes, uh, there's two types. There's a wet stroke or a dry stroke. Uh, in more scientific terms, I guess you would say uh, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. So ischemic is a dry stroke, it means lack of blood flow, and hemorrhagic is like bleeding, it means bleeding, so it's a wet stroke. There are also a, a, a load of neurological illnesses, we're only going to go through a couple of them, but we have MS, multiple sclerosis, chronic pain, pain in itself can be a whole uh, lecture, um, but we won't get too, much, too deep into it, HIV related illnesses, and then some more. Uh, there's plenty uh, of them here. HIV related because remember that uh, human immunodeficiency virus attacks your immune system, which leads you to be or leaves you to be um, more susceptible to other infections. And oftentimes those other infections and lack of immune function will lead to some neurological condition in the later stages. Okay, so injuries and treatments. So the first attempt at neurosurgery that we know of happened about 6,000 years ago in Asia Minor. So the Inca of Peru also attempted this. Um, and basically, they, we, we were able to find out that their attempts of neurosurgery were not successful. Uh, and the reason we know that is because if you try to open someone's skull uh, with tools and you find this skull uh, you know, thousands of years later and the skull is still wide open and cracked and, and not in good condition, you can assume that there wasn't any healing involved. And if there wasn't any healing, it's very, very likely that they ended up dying from that procedure, if not beforehand, um, <clears throat> or shortly after. Uh, but in the 1400s, skulls with holes cut out showed regrowth. So as early as 1400, uh, we saw some advances in neurosurgery, uh, oddly enough. So, you know, neurosurgery today is, is like its own specified field of, of medicine. Uh, but back in the day, it was, it was quite brutal and uh, we've learned a lot from many people's mistakes. So don't take that for granted. Uh, medicine has, has advanced so far that neurosurgery is a specialty and many people can undergo neurosurgery and fully recover. Many people can undergo neurosurgery, depending on the procedure, and be wide awake the entire procedure. So that's quite interesting of, of neurosurgery as a whole. So brain tumors. So let's talk about brain tumors. Again, tumors can be called neoplasms, just a fancy way or different way of saying tumors. Uh, our brain tumors. Each year, more than 79,000 people in the United States are likely to be diagnosed with a brain tumor. Uh, about 26K of those are going to be malignant or cancerous, and 53,000 or 53K are going to be benign, meaning that they're going to grow, but they're, they're not going to be uh, cancerous and spreading. Uh, these are called pr uh, primary brain tumors if they originate in the brain. Okay, if they don't originate in the brain, if they originate in breast cancer or lung cancer, for example, then they'd be called metastatic brain tumors. But if it originates in the brain, it's going to be called a primary brain tumor. Okay. In addition, more than 200,000 people will be diagnosed with a brain tumor that originated elsewhere in the body. That's what I was just saying. So uh, these are called metastatic. Uh, often breast cancer or lung cancer are associated with other brain tumors. Um, <clears throat> so if a cancer spreads from elsewhere, it's called a metastatic brain tumor. If the, the cancer or tumor is only in the brain, then it's going to be called a primary brain tumor. Okay, Take a look at this CT scan. Uh, you can see a large lesion or a large mass uh, uh, that's circled there that is a brain tumor. Uh, brain tumors are named after the cell that they originate from. So a glial cell tumor is called a glioma. Uh, you can get more specific there. So, for example, if you have a tumor that's caused by an oligodendrocyte, it's called an oligodendrioma. <laughs> it's funny. It's a pretty big word, but you guys should be familiar with oligodendrocytes. So an oligodendrioma would be a, a tumor from an oligodendrocyte. Uh, same thing with the Schwann cell, schwannoma. That would be in the periphery or the peripheral nervous system. Uh, so it wouldn't be a brain tumor. Um, but 
you can say, for example, an astrocytoma. Astrocytes can be found in the central nervous system, so astrocytoma. And the most common form of brain cancer is a glioblastoma. Glioblastoma. And this is a tumor that's formed from an immature glial cell that can't stop replicating. Okay. So glioblastoma, you may have heard of a very uh, fatal form of this called glioblastoma multiform, or GBM for short. So glioblastoma is the most common form of brain cancer. The most common form of brain tumor is gonna be a meningioma, and these are usually resectable. They're, they're less of an issue because it's not a direct tumor inside the brain tissue, but they can cause pressure inside of the skull. Uh, but they are easier to get to uh, because they are in the outer layers, so they're they're not actual brain tissue. It's in the meninges. So meningioma means in the meninges, uh, meningioma, right? Remember that your three layers of the meninges are dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, uh, in the order from out to in. Okay. Symptoms of brain tumors. So this is where it gets really gray because a lot of these symptoms will vary, and they will also be quite familiar or quite similar to a boatload of many other neurological illnesses. And that's quite uh, the unfortunate part of, of neuro-related stuff is that a lot of it blends, and that's why we use as many diagnostic tools as we can to rule out other types of illnesses. So CT scans, nerve conduction studies, CSF composition, etc. cetera. Uh, you, can, you use as much as you can when you can when you need it to rule other things out. So tumors, uh, tumor symptoms depend on the type of tumor and the location and the size and the stage of the tumor. So for example, if I have a tumor in the frontal lobe of my brain, it's gonna cause potentially uh, personality changes as well as uh, reduce my ability to plan ahead. It's gonna uh, impede with my higher cognitive thought, my inhibition of, of uh, instinctual or uh, instincts or um, desires, things like that. If I have a tumor in the occipital lobe, it might affect my visual association areas. So it, mean, it might mean that I'm, it's difficult for me to see things or I can't uh, recognize faces. If I have a tumor in the parietal lobe, maybe my sensation is, is messed up. If it's closer to the central sulcus on the frontal lobe, maybe my motor function is, is messed up uh, or uh, you know bothered. So it kind of depends on the area and the size. Um, often people complain about headaches Headaches can be caused by many things, including it can be its own thing. Uh, headaches can be caused by dehydration. It can be they can be caused by staring at a computer screen or TV screen for too long, or being awake for too long, um, too much caffeine. Uh, you know, not just any, not just tumors or even hemorrhagic strokes or uh, aneurysms, but basic everyday things can cause headaches. But headaches are often a very common symptom. Okay. Remember that we don't have pain receptors in our brain, so oftentimes if we are feeling like uh, what would be pain in the brain, it kind of just goes to become a headache. That's kind of what our pain sensation is, I guess. And it's not too reliable. Uh, tumors can also release a lot of glutamate, which can be toxic to surrounding neurons. And the, the metabolic uh, after effects of tumors can have a drastic effect on the neurons surrounding that tumor. Um, cool. So there are, unfortunately, a lot of treatments, and, and this area of science is expanding uh, every year, especially in the fields of like nanotechnology uh, and drug delivery methods and <clears throat> gene therapy, et cetera. Um, so surgery uh, depends on the location, depends on the type, depends on uh, how feasible it is to resect that, that tumor, uh, uh, or if it's feasible to resect a lot of it and then treat it with drugs. Radiation therapy, same thing, you're using radiation to kill cancer cells. Chemotherapy, it means that you're using a chemical agent to kill specific cells. Usually that radiation and chemotherapy is used in combination and it can also lead to a lot of other symptoms like hair loss, it can lead to symptoms like nausea, uh, many other things. Uh, there are also more targeted treatments and these are more, uh, I guess, advanced, more recent. Uh, gamma knife and cyber knife, which use gamma rays or light rays uh, to focus on specific cells um, in very low concentrations, but from multi angles, and so you're you're amplifying uh, the energy at a specific site, uh, and so this is using a lot of physics uh, and, and advancements in the the, the realm of physics. Um, you may have seen this in an episode of Gray's Anatomy uh, because they did use this in one of the episodes. Um, I think it's in the later seasons, like. 13, 14, or 15, 
Uh, it's all a blur now, but uh, I can't tell you the exact episode or season. But it was featured in there. Uh, it's called Gamma Knife or Cyber Knife. Uh, they are different, but they, they function in, in a similar manner. Uh, experimental treatments. This is where it gets fun, and this is where a lot of you guys may be able to add when you guys are my age and even older than me, you guys, you guys can research this stuff. So immunotherapy, um, uh, gene therapy, photodynamic therapy via designed nanoparticles. That's definitely up my realm because I'm doing a master's in nanotechnology. Uh, nanotechnology variations such as drugs or uh, drug carriers. So if you have a, a tumor in the brain, uh, there are a lot of advantages to using nanotechnology or just smaller materials in general. For one, you can pass the blood-brain barrier uh, easily, or more easily, I should say, depending on how you design this, um, which is useful for delivering drugs if you have a nanoparticle that can pass through the, the blood-brain barrier. Uh, photodynamic therapy is interesting because you're using light to basically heat up or release drugs into the, the tumor area um, in a more specified location. So that can be useful. Uh, but again, there are a lot of uh, hurdles in the way. Funding, uh, also the FDA, uh, it takes decades and billions of dollars, not billions, but like tens, of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars from beginning to end to design and test a nanoparticle therapy, especially for cancer, to eventually reach humans uh, and be used in the general commercial sense of medicine. So unfortunately, that's a long ways away, but we do have quite effective treatments now, and that'll hopefully be trickling down to the commercial market soon. So surgery. If a tumor is localized enough and solid, it can be accessed easily without risk of damage surrounding structures. And so if that is the case, then surgery is going to be your primary option in which you would have to open up the skull, right? So that's called a craniotomy, so you can get into the brain. Uh, then uh, what's, what's important to understand is that tumors can't always be completely removed. Uh, and removing a tumor isn't always as easy as pulling a rock out of a... Uh, out of a sand pile. So a lot of people think that, you know, maybe if you have, imagine you have a glass, like a glass of water, but instead of water, it's filled with sand. And a, you have a tumor cell, which is, uh, you can think of a rock. So like a solid rock or a solid marble. And you put that rock or marble inside and deep inside the sand. It's very easy to think about, okay, let me just move all the sand away and then pick at the marble and then I'll pick up the marble and remove it. And then everything should be fine and dandy. But that's not the case at all. Think of a cancerous tumor and many tumors uh, in the brain as being you having a glass of water and you take a drop or two of food coloring and pour it on the top of the glass of water. It's very easy to see how that dye, that, that food coloring, is going to diffuse into uh, the water and mix a little bit. And so because of that mixing and because of that diffusion, uh, it's not as easy to say take the just the blue food coloring out and leave the water alone, right? So post-operation. So the post-op procedures can vary. Uh, what you're seeing here in this image is some of these wafers um, that are put inside the resected site so that any other cancers will be, uh, any other cancer cells that weren't resected will die. Um, and so basically these little wafers will be put there and they have a chemo, chemotherapy or chemo agent uh, in them that will be released slowly over time, which will help keep uh, any other cancers at bay. Okay, They also uh, prescribe steroids to alleviate inflammation, uh, which is important because remember that a skull is usually a fixed system. So if you have inflammation in the brain, you're also gonna be increasing the pressure, which can lead to other uh, symptoms and other more brain damage, excessive brain damage. So you wanna keep inflammation low. Uh, so uh, that's for reducing swelling. And then you may also uh, get other drugs depending on the condition, so anti-epileptic drugs to prevent seizures um, and anything else. Okay, it just kind of depends on the condition and the patient history. Uh, in patients with cancerous tumors, radiation is often given to kill any remaining cancerous tissues post-operation. And that's because you can't always resect everything, especially with, with tool. Even if you have micro tools, it's very uh, just un- unpractical to think that you can remove every single cancer cell one by one because remember uh, you know one cell is super tiny okay um, yeah and then we talked about the chemotherapy wafers already so let's talk about spinal cord injury so an estimated 1.7 million people in the United States sustain a TBI every year um, so a TBI is a traumatic brain injury so this is generally for your central nervous system in terms of what's in your skull you can think of this as a car accident causing this or a blunt force trauma to the head 
uh, say you get hit with a baseball or maybe a baseball bat um, maybe you fall and hit your head maybe something falls onto your head like a coconut or something um, while you're on vacation uh, or you play football or you play hockey or you play soccer any one of those sports that you can hit your head especially repeatedly can cause TBIs however falls are the leading cause of TBIs okay so just falling over and hitting your head is the leading cause of TBI so don't jump into your pool backwards or do anything weird because if you hit your head in the pool that'd be a bad scenario uh, motor vehicle traffic accidents are the leading cause of TBI related death okay so motor vehicle and traffic accidents are the leading cause of TBI related death so please drive carefully and never drive under the influence um, vehicle and always wear your seatbelt please uh, vehicle crashes are also the leading cause of spinal cord injuries uh, and spinal cord injuries have a broad definition as well um, if you have any injury to the uh, proximal nerves for example like a herniated disc this would uh, account as a spinal cord injury so for example herniating a cervical disc and pressing on the nerve roots causing uh, pain in the arm uh, left or right uh, can be considered a spinal cord injury so TBIs there are mild moderate and severe TBIs uh, it just depends on the extent of the injury so a mild TBI is like a small concussion that you get from hitting your head lightly once maybe just falling once uh, maybe you fell off your bike as a kid and you hit your head a moderate TBI is a little bit more serious and then a severe TBI is like the car accident okay uh, like a, a severe car accident and what's important to understand about TBIs is that it's not just about the one-time injury it's not about just the day that you get hit and then you have like a bruise and then the bruise is just gonna clear away TBIs are not like a single event it's a process that could have, obviously it originates from a single event but it's a process that changes over time and so you're the metabolic uh, uh, the, the metabolic changes and manifestations uh, can alter your ability to to process things your your neurons ability to to function well and so over time you can actually see more symptoms later than even just immediately okay so it depends on the extent of the damage obviously um, but don't forget that concussions are mild TBIs so take them seriously Cool, so um, you can also get a TBI from penetration of the brain tissue. So if you have like a, a stab wound in the head or a gunshot wound, uh, that would also consider be considered traumatic brain injuries. It's not just uh, closed skull injuries, but also open skull injuries, okay? And fortunately now, because of our imaging techniques and how readily accessible they are and how well TBIs are being studied because of the movie Concussion and because of uh, you know sports teams and things like that, uh, we now know a lot more about TBIs than we did, say, 50 years ago. Okay. Now, we can't talk about concussions and not talk about CTE. So CTE is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Chronic means repeated or over a long time. Traumatic is obviously coming from the TBI, so traumatic brain injury. Um, so trauma, repeated trauma, leading to encephalopathy or uh, dysfunction of the brain or death of neurons. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy or brain condition. Uh, repetitive hits to the head can lead to CTE over time. Again, uh, how many repetitive hits? It's not like we have a single number. I guess that would depend. But if you play, say, football, uh, American football from a young age, you would be more susceptible to uh, CTE over time, especially if you continue playing. Okay. And TBIs are a gradual process, and that would make CTEs even, or C the diagnosis of CTE even more of a gradual process. So. 10, 20, 30 years later, uh, not just a week, a month, uh, or two later. Okay, Repetitive hits to the head uh, lead to the buildup of tau proteins. You might remember tau proteins from Alzheimer's disease. Remember that tau is one of the proteins that make the uh, cytoskeleton of some of the cells in your brain. And so when you repeatedly hit that, you are knocking tau basically out. You're jumbling that tau around, and they will fall off. They might dissociate, and they, will, they can be uh, clumped up together. Uh, it's a process called amyloidosis. Um, but basically these tau proteins can be toxic, they can aggregate and then cause issues in the cellular mechanisms that normally need to play out for you to be healthy and so that will lead to neuron death. So tau proteins, remember that from Alzheimer's but also in CTE and it has to do with the cytoskeleton of the neuron. So remember that tau is inside the neuron not outside whereas amyloid beta amyloid is uh, builds up outside of the cell in Alzheimer's 
Now we do not see beta amyloid buildup in CTE, so that's different. But again, these are different conditions, but they have some similarities. So therefore, CTE is characterized by death of brain tissue caused by repetitive hits to the head. Okay. <clears throat> SCI, spinal cord injury, is this stuff that I find really interesting. If one day I could research spinal cord regeneration, that's kind of my goal within the realm of nano and uh, neurological medicine, biomedicine. So SCI can permanently damage nerve cells and cause a variety of disabilities, including various degrees of paralysis. Now one thing that you have to remember, and I'm going to go back to the picture of the spinal cord. If you look over here to the left, the lower the injury, the less is going to be affected. So this is a top-down system. Okay, That means that nerves that are in the brain are, uh, are going to communicate through the spinal cord and so if you cut, say for example, the spinal cord at the level of T12, right here, the 12th thoracic vertebrae, if you cut the spinal cord there, uh, you're only cutting off a little bit of that lumbar, uh, the, your spinal cord ends at the lower level of L1. So if you cut it at T12, you're losing a lot of the nerves that will eventually innervate your uh, uh, part of your leg as well as your groin. And so you would lose that function, everything below. Everything above would be untouched though. However, if I were to cut, say, at the level of C7, everything below C7 would be affected, okay, which would include part of your arm, maybe not your entire arm, because most of the brachial plexus starts at C5 uh, all the way to T1. But C7 and below would all be paralyzed. And so you wouldn't be able to move your legs, you wouldn't be able to move your thorax or your torso. You would be essentially paralyzed all the way down, and that could be bad. The higher you go, if you, if you cut your spinal cord to the level of, say, C3 or C4, that would be potentially fatal because you have a nerve called the phrenic nerve, and that nerve comes from C3, C4, and C5, and that will innervate your diaphragm. So if you cut that, your ability to breathe would be largely affected. You might be, have, be, have to put it on a, on a ventilator. So the concept here is that the higher you go, the, the larger the extent of the injury and when it comes to the spinal cord. The lower you go, the less of the extent of the injury. Okay, so let's move on. Currently, the only FDA approved drug is uh, methylprednisone, and it's only effective if you administer it in a really short period of time. Now, that is not essential, uh, not really useful if, for example, a uh, special operations soldier deep in, in, in you know, a war zone uh, has a spinal cord injury from an explosive. Uh, being able to diagnose that and giving them the appropriate medicine and having it on hand is not practical. Uh, so we need better and more, uh, you know, effective drugs that, that are more practical for those types of scenarios uh, for the future. Similarly, with other with other injuries, for example, a car accident. Maybe you drive. Maybe someone drives their car uh, off the road and hits a tree, and it's a, an empty road, and they're not found for a day or two or something like that. Uh, we needed more effective drugs that uh, have a larger window. Much of neuroscience-related research focuses, focuses on this axon regeneration and spinal cord regeneration um, because it's one of the biggest hinders, right? We, we want to give people who are paraplegic or even quadriplegic the ability to move, uh, live healthier lives, and be able to, to live the way that, that many of us do. Um, uh, a lot of research also is looking into stem cells and nerve grafts, which is looking at specific materials to build these grafts of out of so that nerves tend to grow faster and more efficiently. Uh, drugs, so chemicals that can be used to either prevent the loss of more neurons or to um, uh, to uh, hopefully uh, expand on the regeneration of the existing neurons and axons. Uh, and those are just some of the, the research areas. <clears throat> Neurological Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. So more than half of the people infected with HIV are going to develop HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, which uh, the acronym is HAND. Uh, and that can cause mental problems such as difficulty concentrating, memory deficits, coordination deficits, all of the host of deficits that you would think of if your brain in large part was compromised to an infection. So you'd be difficulty thinking, difficulty forming memories, etc. Uh, notice how many of those things, concentrating, memory, coordinate, uh, coordination, difficulty with decision making, those are higher order cognitive functions that get affected first. So frontal lobe, parietal lobe, um, that kind of stuff, medial temporal lobe, uh, can lead to progressive dementia called AIDS dementia. Remember that dementia is this, the, the, excuse me, <laughs> this big umbrella term, that's what I was trying to say, 
is this big umbrella term, so dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia that we know of, but there's also frontotemporal dementia, there's also Lewy body dementia, and there's also AIDS dementia, which is what you're learning about now. So this is the neurological acquired immune deficiency syndrome. AIDS dementia comes from the HIV. Okay, We really don't know the total mechanism. Uh, we don't understand exactly. It could be proteins created by the virus. It could be that you become so immunodeficient that other things get into your head uh, and cause damage, like other proteins or other just natural metabolic products. Uh, could be metabolic waste. Uh, so we don't really understand that completely. Um, and the pool of people to be able to research that is, is fortunately small, but also unfortunately small for research purposes. Um, so hopefully in the next coming years we can uh, expand on this. MS, so multiple sclerosis is uh, pretty well known. It's an inflammatory disease of the CNS, so it's usually autoimmune related. Uh, and it can be diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40, but this is uh, the disease that attacks the myelin sheath of the central nervous system. So oftentimes when I'm teaching uh, the classes here at UCF for clinical neuroanatomy uh, and neuroscience, I tell my students to differentiate between MS and something called GBS. So MS is multiple sclerosis. It's demyelination caused inside of the central nervous system uh, as from an autoimmune disorder. But GBS or Guillain-Barre syndrome is the same sort of equivalent but in the peripheral nervous system. So those two things are very different. Um, one affects the central, the other affects the peripheral. So please note multiple sclerosis and uh, that it's an autoimmune disorder that attacks the myelin sheath of the CNS axons. And usually you can diagnose this uh, first when in the eyes. So you can see that in the optic nerves they get affected first, uh, usually. Um, the scarring is what gives the name. So when you, when you destroy the, the myelin sheath of these neurons, of these axons, uh, it gives a scarring look and so it's called multiple sclerosis or sclerotic or scarring. Uh, that's where it gets its name. Okay, so obviously if you damage the myelin sheath, you're going to impair nerve function. That means that the signal that's going from one neuron to the other or one neuron to something else, um, it's, it, that connection is going to be disrupted, which means you're going to have a, a, like a lagging signal, a lagging communication. Sometimes that communication is stopped completely. Uh, and that leads to other complications down the line. Um, so impaired nerve function is what you should just remember, okay? Here are some symptoms, and again, these are really broad, but uh, you guys should know. The optic nerves and cerebellum are the most commonly affected there. So numbness, clumsiness, blurred vision is one of the first things that kind of propagates so that you can diagnose that. Um, slurred speech, so things are slower, so you can't really control your facial muscles as well or as quickly. Uh, just general weakness, pain, uncontrollable, un uncontrollable, excuse me, tremors, uh, and that's because these are these would be upper motor neuron lesions, memory loss, depression, and more. Okay, there's a lot more that that comes with that. So uncontrolled, tr uncontrollable tremors. Okay, I touched on on wet on strokes already a little bit when in the first bit, but here's what I was talking about. So we have wet strokes and dry strokes. Uh, wet strokes can be due to trauma. So if you get, for example, uh, the same scenario of with the, the TBI in a car accident, uh, if you hit your head hard enough, potentially you could lead to brain bleeding, and that's called a hemorrhagic stroke. This is why people who drive Formula One cars or MotoGP, and if you're riding a bike or riding a motorcycle, you should definitely wear a helmet because any, any hit to the head that could lead to TBI uh, can also potentially, in, in worser cases, lead to hemorrhagic strokes. Um, and that would be bad. Bleeding in, inside the brain would cause an increase in intracranial pressure, lots of headaches, potentially a lot of damage to the brain. Hemorrhagic strokes can be due to trauma, but also aneurysms. So that's the ballooning of blood vessels. And then something called AVMs. You don't really have to know AVMs too much. This is called an ar arteriovenous malformation. That's kind of a little bit, when you guys get to UCF, uh, we'll teach you more about those later. Okay, but for now, trauma and aneurysms. Dry strokes are usually caused by plaques, so atherosclerosis, so obesity, lack of physical activity, heart disease. This is the blockage of vessels in your brain. Okay, so this is called a dry stroke because now you're, you're blocking blood from getting to where it needs to go. So usually hypertensive patients are at higher risk for this, um, people who are obese or have uh, low physical activity. Okay. Let's talk about chronic pain. So chronic pain uh, can be acute, 
uh, so pain can be acute, excuse me, but if it's recurring, this is what is considered chronic pain. You can think of lower back pain as probably a really common one. Headaches also uh, uh, are included here. So for someone like me who herniated his L4, L5 disc, um, I dealt with, with chronic back pain for a while. Uh, luckily for me, I, I figured it out. I'm young, I was, I was healthy, and I kind of fixed my issue. It was a lifting issue, so learn how to lift properly before you start trying to push weight. Um, save you a lot of time and, and pain. Uh, but if this was recurring, like, let's say that my herniated disc healed, and uh, I'm still, I'm still uh, experiencing pain. This would be considered chronic pain and uh, different techniques would have to be used in order to relieve my symptoms. Um, so back pain, sometimes it's caused by herniated discs, other times it's, it's uh, really just mental, uh, and other times it's caused by weak muscles uh, and, and pinching of nerves. You know, there's a lot of reasons for it, but when it's more than just one or two times and it lasts for weeks or even months, that's when it's called chronic pain. So treatment, uh, you can uh, prevent pain by using drugs like anesthesia to temporarily block pain receptors. Novocaine is common. We also have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which although if you may have not have heard of NSAIDs or NSAIDs, depending on who you ask, uh, you maybe have heard of them before. Uh, so Tylenol, uh, acetaminophen, I believe is the chemical compound. Uh, that is an, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Okay, you can use those to relieve arthritic pain as well. And we use, uh, we actually create our own pain reducing chemicals called endorphins. So you might recall from a previous lecture that I gave you that when you run, your body naturally re re releases endorphins and this is called the runner's high. Uh, so running is quite the traumatic thing. So you're, you're constantly pounding your body weight against the floor. And although this can lead to things like shin splints and muscle soreness, Potentially, you'll feel really good afterwards, and that's why, uh, or that's because of the endorphins. Now, obviously, if you're if you're experiencing shin splints, you should reduce your mileage, but that's a different lecture altogether. Okay, so research into endorphins led to um, essentially the, op the the our understanding of opioid receptors, which would eventually lead to the op opioid uh, epidemic, um, which we can we can really effectively reduce pain nowadays. However, these drugs are quite uh, addictive, so there's a there's a give and take, and there there has to be uh, s some some more research into how to appropriately use these drugs to not get the patients addicted to them. So, question number one: Let's see who is paying attention. Okay, multiple sclerosis attacks peripheral nerve myelin. True or false? Pause the video now. All right. So, multiple sclerosis attacks peripheral nerve myelin, true or, far, true or false? The answer to this is going to be false, because remember, GBS, or Guillain-Barre, is what affects the peripheral nerve myelin. MS is the central nervous system myelin, so this would be false. Question number two, CTE is characterized by the buildup of which protein? Pause the video now. Okay, so CTE is characterized by the buildup of which protein? A amyloid, B alpha synuclein, C tau, D all of the above or E all, uh, none of the above. The answer is tau. Remember that tau, just like Alzheimer's, builds up in the inside of the neurons. So that's that's interesting. Question number three: Hemorrhagic strokes have which associated risk factors? Okay, pause the video. Hemorrhagic strokes have which associated risk factors? A, obesity, B, heart disease, C, physical inactivity, all the above. You guys should know that none of the above. So those were the risk factors associated with ischemic strokes. Remember that hemorrhagic means bleeding, so that means a wet stroke. Obesity, heart disease, and physical inactivity is what leads to atherosclerosis, which is the buildup of plaque in your blood vessels. So the answer is none of the above because ischemic strokes were those risk factors. There aren't any necessarily any uh, risk factors for hemorrhagic strokes uh, except for blood thinners. Blood thinners would be one, but that's, to, that's for another time. Question number four, naturally occurring human opioids are known as, pause the video now. Naturally occurring human opioids are known as A, novocaine, B, endorphins, C, prostaglandins, or D, none of the above. 
The answer is the endorphins. Remember, this is what causes the runner's high, endorphins, the feel-good uh, chemical. Uh, I believe this is the last question. There are three drugs that are FDA approved for spinal cord injuries, true or false? Pause the video now. The answer is false, only one, methylprednisone, okay? And that's pretty much it for this presentation. If you enjoyed it, let us know in the comments. Uh, if you want, uh, if you have any questions, leave it in the comments. And if you want anything specific, please request it in the comments down below. Thank you so much for your time uh, and have a good rest of your week.